Gilbert walked back into the house and cast a vote against the uh, most recently. And it really brings down, no matter how we feel about all of this, the idea that we can sit in a room and discuss it and agree or disagree is just so vitally important. And we can't stand for that. I just want you to say I hope that you will find me to be a good listener. As a result, you do not have to shout. Uh, we do our best to try, and I really am here uh, to listen and for the exchange of information uh, to be sure. I just want to close by saying uh, I did have an opportunity to talk to a woman one time in the aftermath of something, and two days later on the street, she said, come on to me. She said, I was really so pleased to have a chance to be there, but I was so afraid to stand up and ask the questions. Because people were screaming at each other during the course of that. And I really left feeling that I didn't have a chance to participate. And I know tonight I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask everybody that we can respect that in this crowd tonight. So thank you for me. Let me just take a moment to walk through a few observations. First, a recent Gallup poll just came out, and it said that 80% of the people are very dissatisfied with Congress. 80%. Another 75%
A second factor is this record debt that we are dealing with. A bankrupt business cannot create jobs. And a bankrupt country will not be able to create jobs either. And unfortunately, we are looking right now at a country that's dealing with a current deficit of $1.4 trillion and a current debt that's in excess of $14 trillion. I think there's another factor is our tax code, a non-competitive tax code, the complexity of this code. The fact of the matter is there are 20 volumes, some 17,000 pages, and that's just for you know, the, the, the code itself. There have been since 1986 some 15,000 changes that have been made. We've got to work on simplification. And also what that implies as well, I do think that when we talk about taxes, it's the issue as well of the taxes to our businesses, the taxes to our corporations. We are in a non-competitive situation. We're in a non-competitive situation around the world. And what I would like to see is the ability for us to take on those tax breaks for big corporations, to close the loopholes, to look after taking down some of those subsidies, but in return, create the kind of safe and predictable tax structure that will allow people to have the confidence to investigate and create job opportunity and less of red tape. Red tape, the issue of the over-bureaucratic nature of what's going on in terms of agencies and others. The involvement that's coming out of Washington. I sat down, and one of the things that I traditionally like to do is just get groups of people together. This is different business and job creators. I sat down in just the Springfield Country Club uh, two nights ago. Is there something funny about that? Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's funny about that? Yeah, I'm not a country club person either, but the Springfield Country Club is a public was a public facility right up the street. Right. And I sat down in a restaurant yeah. no, that is a public restaurant with a group of people who are job creators. So the fact that yeah. we yeah. have yeah. 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 so a in the restaurant, we're being here. Okay. <laughs> One of the things, when I spoke to the numbers of people who were there with the job creators, they were talking about the frustration that they had with the number of issues that they've got to face. One person had three people just trying to keep compliance with all the forms that they had to fill out to do government contracts. One of the issues that we are dealing with right now are the annual deficits that are exploding. And if you look at this number right here, certainly Republicans are just as responsible for the start of this in 2008. As a member of this audience, I suggest that anyone who has something to say politely ask to be recognized.
But see who owns that debt. This is the one that we are leaving to our children. In 1970, that debt was about 283 billion. About 5% of it was owned by foreign countries. In 1990, that debt grew to $2.4 trillion. And as you can see, about 19% has been held by foreign countries. Today, that debt is 47%. And the largest share of it, about 30%, is held by China. The next largest, Japan. In fact, 42 cents of every dollar that we are spending right now is being borrowed. And in fact, July 27th was the day. Every dollar spent from July 27th on until the end of the year is going to be a dollar that we are borrowing from our children that is being loaned to us by the Chinese. Let me put the next slide, but what are the billions and the trillions? How do we take this? Suppose we're talking to try to put it in perspective of a family in our district. The typical family in our district, median income, is $56,000. If that family was the United States, this is what their accounts would look, at, look like. They would have an income of $56,000, but they'd be spending $79,000 a year. That's our nation. And in addition, they would have a credit card debt that is $300,000. But how many people do you know with a $300,000 credit card debt right now? This is America that we are in today. I think we've got to do a couple of things. First, we've got to get our fiscal house in order. Next, we've got to make place America a better place to do business. I have a sense of confidence in the future of America, but it is not going to be easy to get there. Now, one of the things we do in a forum like this is a chance for you to talk to me. So I will point we will come and they will give an opportunity to have a question asked and answered. But once again, I'm going to ask that what we do is respect each other. And when a person has the opportunity to ask the question, they be given the chance, and after you've asked your question, I appreciate that there's many more who want to ask questions as well, and perhaps that you would allow somebody else to have the floor as well. Yes, ma'am, back here, since you're closer to the microphone. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Yes, I'm uh, Therese Mallory, uh, land down in Pennsylvania. I'm with the LaRouche Political Action Committee. Uh, first of all, on a very positive note, I want to congratulate you, Congressman, for having the guts to be here because a lot of people in, throughout Eastern Pennsylvania want, wanted to have town meetings and their congressmen were too fearful. They were inviting. They weren't having these town meetings. So I, I think it's great. Uh, on well, the issue, your question now is not going to be an easy one. No. <laughs> uh, on the issue of the uh, deficit spending, uh, there's one thing you and other congressmen aren't talking about, it's the big white elephant in the middle of the room, which is above the $14 that's on the budget of debt, which is an additional $16 trillion owned up to by the Federal Reserve Report, which they had to, by law, print and December of last year, 2010, as to when the bailout, since the bailout started under Bush 2008, continued with a vengeance under Obama, and they admitted by December of 2010 to have printed 16 trillion to bail out not only uh, certain uh, dubious uh, outfits on Wall Street like Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Chase, AIG, and so on, but international banksters. Uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, Banco Santander, First Union of uh, Switzerland, and on and on. Uh, and we know that uh, it, they Get have more since that time. The question is, there is a bill in Congress, which you know about, I'm sure, H.R. 1489, uh, the Prudent Banking Act of uh, 2011, Marcy Kaptur, Democrat from Ohio, Walter Jones, Republican from North Carolina, have introduced it as 
35 bipartisan co-signers, it will end the bailout, make it illegal, by restoring Glass Steagall to an American banking law for 66 years, which because none of our Pennsylvania congressmen or women have signed on to this. And as you have had the courage to have the meeting here tonight and the other meetings, please have the courage to co-sign this bill. Thank you. Is that, you, you want me to respond or just say Well, the, the, the question relates to this bill 1489, the Black Act, was originally designed to create a separation so that banks would not be able to get into the or you know get into the business of insurance, get into the business that, that created these the, the huge institutions uh, that then became the subject of the bail uh, I think the answer to it is to let the banks know that there will be no bailouts. I don't know what I will do on that bill, ma'am. I have seen somebody propose it whether or not it gets out of the committee or to a point where you have an opportunity to vote before. I mean, I will say generally, and then let me move to the next question. We're all frustrated with the activity of the big banks on Wall Street. We're also in a global economy, and one of the things that we've got to be able to do is to assure, which I don't think we did do, that we haven't created institutions that are too big to fail, uh, and that those banks be held accountable for the decisions that they make and the implications of the decisions that they make, uh, and it not be the American taxpayer that bails them out when they don't. Yes, sir. <coughs> Yeah. You retire on a 401k just like the rest of us do. 
Not in Wisconsin. What I put into my, effectively, my 401k. I make contributions every month that are matched to, to, to a certain extent up to a, to, to a, to a point. Uh, as every other government employee does, I have the option of investing my money in uh, three or four different kinds of programs that are made available by the federal employee, health, you know, the federal employee benefits program. It is no different than anybody else. When I leave, uh, if I, I want to continue to serve you, the day that I am done, I get no more than what I paid into that system. And with respect to the health care system, I do not take the federal health care benefits. But the fact of the matter is the, 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 the plan is the same for the members of Congress as it is for every other federal employee in which you are able to purchase the coverage that's available to everyone else to serve. Your, 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 the information that you have uh, is not accurate. Okay, but you know, well, I was, uh, ma'am, uh, over here. He wasn't doing anything. Well, I think we've got to allow each person to serve the people here today. I, I respect the network. I don't know. Allow me to start Well, I just want to start out by saying, uh, Representative Meehan, I don't think the problem is that you have a pension and health care problem. I don't begrudge you that at all. The problem is that the rest of us don't. Yes. So many of us don't. My question is, the federal government is suffering from recession-induced shortages, shortages caused by the near collapse of the finance and housing sectors of our economy. This near collapse is due in part to rapid speculation. A Wall Street transfer tax would bring in harmful financial speculation and also provide revenue to support the federal budget so that Americans' needs for jobs and safety net supports will not be denied. Will you support and will you encourage members of the Super Committee to support a provision to increase federal revenues and, and reduce the harmful speculation via a Wall Street transfer tax? Yeah. 
playing in creeks down the, down the road from the steel company uh, in which the water was full of it was brown and full of sides. Now I know that that was just you know, chemicals being used. And so there have been tremendous accomplishments that have been made, but you would ask where we are, you know, with, with the EPA and the regulations. And here's one of my concerns. I, I'm willing to work along with the EPA, but what we have to have is a sense of balance with respect to what the EPA is doing. Because what has happened has been that a fair amount of the issues that have been before Congress, where there has not been success in getting laws passed, the EPA has come and is taking a more aggressive stance uh, in, in doing their own interpretations of what what things would be. And one of those deals with you know the air issues. Water issues. Let me give you an example of what the EPA is doing right here in our backyard to show you where balance has become in your budget. <coughs> One of the places that's the most overseen and regulated are our refineries. We happen to have two refineries right here in the lower part of the district. There are 2,000 people that work at those refineries. There are enough, now, I'm going to ask you, please, allow me to. I there are 2,000 people who work directly at those refineries. There are another 4,000 to 5,000 that they've identified as directly, indirectly associated. They pay big taxes to the school districts in that area. Those are good paying union jobs in our backyard. The EPA has gone to one of the refineries and because the water that they bring in to filtrate through the system, after they clean it, it never leaves the pipes. It stays within, serves as a pool. After it's cleaned, it's returned to the river. It goes back two degrees warmer than it comes in. The EPA has said that that's a violation. The EPA has told them that they must build a water cooling tower. The water cooling tower is going to cost $350 million to construct. Those jobs will not be in the bottom of our district. The EPA comes through and says, we're going to require you to build a $350 million building tax. So I'm looking at these kinds of things in which what we need is reasonable regulation that takes into consideration the implication of the jobs. I had Secretary Jackson before me on an oversight committee hearing, and I asked her point blank, I said, Secretary, the President himself has written a directive, and in that directive, you must take into consideration the impact of this regulation on jobs. Have you done it? The fact of the matter is, she didn't know. And then when you looked at it, when you looked at the record, they really had none. So ma'am, there is a balance. I will support reasonable efforts. I have been part of it. But I'm also going to fight to protect those jobs. That is in our backyard. Not to be able to Sunoco can afford it. Poor little oil company. Yeah. Yeah. This suit that is charged with you know, proposing needs to be told that American business is not the poor. That's right. Right. Corporations aren't people. systematically eliminated. 
So I want to know, will you have a preference for the board? Yeah. You lie.
jobs overseas or money overseas, or what do we do? Why don't we support tax breaks for job creators here in the United States? Uh, I am the co-sponsor, one of the three original Republican co-sponsors, working with three Democrats in a bipartisan fashion on the life science repatriation bill. That will do precisely that. What it does is it enables there to be money that is being generated overseas by American companies and profits. Now those dollars are already taxed in that foreign country. For them to bring it back here into the United States, they will get taxed a second time. There's over a trillion dollars sitting in foreign banks, foreign assets overseas. The repatriation bill will allow them to bring back those dollars into the United States at a huge tax basis, but they will have to invest those dollars. They have to invest those dollars in creating jobs here in the United States. Thank you.